Well, thank you to the Wellesley Historical Society and the Wellesley Free Library for hosting me. It's fun to come and give this talk uh, in places outside of Newton. Um, gingerbread history is something that we can all relate to. And uh, I will be telling you all about how gingerbread became associated with Christmas. And the story is not as straightforward as you would imagine. Uh, so um, I'm going to start with a tale that we all know pretty well. I actually have printed out an original of it um, that I found in an archive. It's uh, the gingerbread man. Run, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Uh-oh. Um, we need to advance our slides here. There we go. Uh, so um, this is a children's folk tale that um, is pretty old. Nobody knows exactly when it started, as uh, most of these folk tales are. It's about a gingerbread cookie that comes to life. And I see some children in the audience. Do you remember what happens to the gingerbread cookie that comes to life uh, off the cookie sheet? I don't know whether you're familiar with the story, but anyone can answer this. Um, That's right, yeah. So the, the cookie comes to life, runs out the door. If those of you who couldn't hear it, um, people chase him. The fox is finally the clever one that gets the cookie and eats him up. Um, it's a, a variation on what are called fleeing pancake stories, and they're told in Europe. And that started with a pancake coming to life and, and running out the door. Um, <laughs> the gingerbread boy um, that I printed out, it was. Uh, Build is a story for very little folks, and it first appeared in print in May 1875 in an American magazine named St. Nicholas. Um, now, surprisingly, St. Nicholas had nothing to do with Christmas. It was just a literary magazine for children, and Louisa May Alcott published a story in the same issue. So uh, even the famous novelists uh, needed to publish in magazines to make a living. Uh, the uh, contributor of this story said she didn't write it herself, but she learned it from a servant girl, this is her words, from Maine, uh, told it to my children. It interested them so much that I thought it worth preserving. I asked where she found it, and she said an old lady told it to her in her childhood. So this story did not contain the line, run, run, run as fast as you can. But the gingerbread boy said, I've run away from a little old woman, a little old man, and I can run away from you. I can. Uh, so the run, run, run line probably came from a retelling of it. Um, it's certainly fun to hear about all this, but this doesn't quite explain how uh, gingerbread across what became associated with Christmas. So for that, we have to go back to Europe um, and uh, actually a little further back. Um, to ancient times. Um, the plant that produces ginger uh, is actually native to Asia, uh, but it came to the Roman Empire through trade, and uh, probably trade with India. The Romans used ginger to flavor their sauces, and then when the Roman Empire fell, supplies kind of dried up until the famous Marco Polo uh, came along and began trading with um, China, and uh, he reopened some of the trade routes between Europe and the Far East. And this was in the 13th century. Um, and ginger became very popular in medieval Europe, where there was a passion for all spices. Um, the scarcity of ginger drove up its prices, as well as its value in cooking. And it was the second most traded spice after pepper. I found that really interesting. Yeah. Um, so people in medieval use, Europe used ginger in meat, not necessarily in sweets, because it could hide a spoiled taste. Um, and uh, then in baked goods, it was sometimes used as a preserving agent. Um, it was also thought of as a medicine. Um, a lot of us know that ginger or ginger ale helps us if we're nauseous or seasick, or um, it's also an anti-inflammatory. Um, but um, one of the fans, one of the myths about what ginger could really do and not do was Henry VIII of England. And he thought ginger would help him develop immunity to the plague. 
Unfortunately, he didn't get the plague anyway, to my knowledge, but I don't think it was the ginger that helped him avoid the plague. Um, so gingerbread, um, now this is the hard, crisp kind, um, became popular in um, medieval fairs. And those uh, fairs happened in England, Holland, France, and Germany. Um, they were sometimes called gingerbread fairs or fairings. Um, the gingerbread was cut into various fun shapes, as you can see. These are people, but it was also cut into uh, flowers, animals, letters of the alphabet. Um, and sometimes these were gilded for decoration. Um, and eventually the term gingerbread became associated with something fancy and kind of decorative. To um, that point, um, there are so-called gingerbread cottages, probably in Wellesley, I know there's some in Newton. Um, it was a popular style of Victorian architecture. Um, so that's kind of where that came from. Um, now, the Germans uh, were the first to create gingerbread houses. And um, they were made out of spice cookies. And they often represented another folk tale. You can probably figure out that Hansel and Gretel. It's written in German. Um, but um, it was um, it's supposed to be the witch's house. And uh, the name for it was, uh, trans it translates from German into houses for nibbling at. Uh, so that is um, what the, where the gingerbread house tradition comes from. Um, I'm going to just go back for a minute to this slide of the cookies shaped like people. Um, that goes back to Queen Elizabeth I um, and her royal gingerbread maker. Imagine that being your job. You get to make gingerbread for the royal court. Um, she uh, I'm <coughs> had people make um, gingerbread men to represent important visitors uh, to the court. Uh, this was in the late 1500s. And uh, among the commoners, the gingerbread was sometimes used as a love charm. Um, the, if a man ate a gingerbread figure, um, he was supposed to fall in love with the woman who gave it to him. And then there was another wives' tale that said that those who eat a gingerbread heart are going to fall in love with the person who gave it to them. So, you know, that probably worked as well as ginger being eaten to avoid the plague, but, you know, <laughs> it was a nice myth. Um, so, you know, that is, is where some of the cookies and um, stories about gingerbread uh, originated. But we still have to get to America because we're still trying to answer the question how did gingerbread become associated with Christmas holidays? Uh, so um, the um, colonists brought, most of the early ones came from England, and so they brought their love of ginger with them from Europe. Um, and uh, that was in the 17th and 18th century. But it was still was not part of the Christmas holiday. Um, the style of gingerbread, there were two main styles. And I feel like there could be a huge debate probably here in this audience about uh, which ones people like. Um, the one on the left is the soft gingerbread, um, which would be more like cut into squares, as you can see from that photo. Um, and then the one on the right is more like the ginger snaps, and that's like the hard cookies. And the recipe that uh, you picked up, if you picked it up, is more of the ginger snap variety, except it doesn't turn brown. So if you make it, be forewarned, it's still kind of pale. Um, it still tastes good, but You'll see there's a, another photo of it coming up in the talk. Um, so um, molasses, um, in Europe, honey was often the sweetener. But in the colonies, molasses replaced it because it was more widely available as a sweetener. Um, and uh, the, um, one of the fans of the soft kind of gingerbread was George Washington's mother. Um, this is, um, her name was Mary Ball Washington. And there are no portraits of her. So this is kind of an artist's depiction. I think she looks awful. <laughs> she looks like she's going to fall down. And George Washington doesn't quite look like it uh, himself either. But this is what an artist thinks she looked like, because there are no portraits of her. I guess you know George, she died before George Washington became famous. Um, so her recipe, though, has definitely survived. Um, and it's for the soft kind of gingerbread. And it used 
butter, molasses, cooking sherry, milk, ginger, and other spices. And those other spices were cinnamon, nutmeg, and mace. Um, and then a proponent of the hard gingerbread uh, was Amelia Simmons. Um, and she's the author of what many consider to be the first American cookbook. Um, it was called American Cookery. And uh, it was uh, published in 1796 in Hartford. So it has New England ties as well. Um, and her cookies contain nutmeg and heavy cream, as well as ginger, of course. Um, and uh, this is what they look like um, when they're baked. Um, so um, again, they're, they're not, they, they almost look more like vanilla cookies or sugar cookies, but they definitely have ginger in them. Um, so in the early days in America, um, you know, people were eating these for a treat. Um, in Virginia, voters were given gingerbread cookies to encourage them to vote. Um, <laughs> they were also given beer, but that's another story. Um, and then um, in New England, gingerbread was often served at what was called Muster Day. Um, that was a gathering of county militias. And uh, so again, gingerbread popular, but not, not yet for the holidays. Um, and some of that has to do with the Puritans, um, those fun-loving people who didn't like Christmas. Um, they really outlawed Christmas celebrations. Um, here is a little information about it. Um, in 1659, they um, passed a law and um, uh, uh, fined people five shillings for not working or being caught feasting, how horrible, uh, on Christmas Day. Um, and um, the reason they didn't like Christmas is they were complete originalists about the scripture. And it is not mentioned anywhere in the scripture that Jesus was born on December 25th. Um, and uh, the only holiday that the scripture mentioned was the Sabbath, and that's the only one they observed. Um, and uh, the British government wanted to repeal this edict um, outlawing Christmas in uh, the Puritan world in 1681, uh, and they did, but Christmas still was not a popular holiday uh, in Boston or in New England in general where the Puritans held sway. Um, and then later on, another problem with Christmas after the revolution was that the British celebrate Christmas. And so during the revolutionary time, well, of course, people wouldn't want to do something that the British did. So um, in the Boston area, um, I did a little research about what people did uh, in Christmas, on Christmas um, in the 1770s. Um, There's a report from Edward Durant III, who owned a house that is now a museum in Newton, the Durant Kenrick House. I also recently found out he is related to the people who founded Wellesley College, also named Durant. Uh, so that's an interesting community tie-in. Anyway, what did he do on Christmas Day? He went to the Old South Meeting House in Boston. That's what he did. And uh, then um, another uh, family member, Anna Green Winslow, uh, wrote in 1771 that she was 11 years old and she sewed a shirt on Christmas Day. Um, so the Puritans did visit each other for New Year's Day and they might have served gingerbread cookies. Um, so um, as Christmas became more popular, um, then um, some of the cookie traditions started to come into holiday celebrations. Um, by the early 19th century, um, you know, the Puritans were still dominant in Massachusetts, but there were people moving to Massachusetts and New England from other parts of the world that did celebrate Christmas. And, um, it was also time for Christmas to have an image change. It was a body, drunken holiday. Um, it had that reputation. It was pretty true. Um, so it became known more as a family holiday um, because, in part, um, who knows that poem, The Night Was the Night Before Christmas? OK, so the poet of that, um, Clement Clark Moore, uh, published this in 1823. Its official title, I never, knew, well, I knew this, but I didn't remember. It's called A Visit from St. Nicholas. And um, the poem laid out some of the rituals which became more widely practiced, like hanging stockings, giving gifts, 
Santa's arrival. Um, and uh, I'll just read you a tiny excerpt. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children all were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. Another thing that became popular um, right in the early to middle part of the 19th century was the Christmas tree. Um, and you can see that the Christmas tree was sort of um, sad looking in that um, illustration on the left. Um, that's when people first started having them in their houses. And then um, later on in the 19th century, you can see that the whole concept of Christmas is much more well developed, where you've got the tree in color, you've got the ornaments, you have the happy family um, ooing and aahing about the um, lights and the ornaments and the presents underneath. So um, Christmas is definitely becoming more popular as a holiday as the um, century progresses. And then um, the uh, first president to bring a Christmas tree into the White House. Uh, this did not happen until 1856, and it was Franklin Pierce, who's not one of the presidents we really think about or talk about anymore. I, I wouldn't have picked his name out as the first president to have a tree, but he was. Um, and then presidents ever after had trees in the White House, including, um, I found this from the Kennedy archives, um, and uh, so um, this is what Christmas at the White House looked like in 1962. Um, and I don't know what President Trump's tree looks like, but I'm sure there's going to be a photo and a lighting and, and some merriment if there hasn't already been. Um, now, um, Massachusetts made Christmas a state holiday in 1856. Uh, but the reason will surprise you it actually was not because they wanted people to celebrate Christmas, per se. They wanted it, it was part of a labor movement, and they wanted to ha, um, make sure that people had guaranteed time off of work. And so at the same time, that in that same bill that they made Christmas a holiday, they also made July 4th and Washington's birthday uh, state holidays. Um, and uh, during the debate about whether this bill should pass, one of the opponents said, business should not be interrupted for Christmas. But of course, he was voted down. And Christmas, Massachusetts was ahead of the curve, despite its Puritan tradition. Um, Christmas did not become a national United States holiday until 1870. So you can see that we're still a long way from having gingerbread on the menu, but we're getting there. <laughs> so. Um, the next thing that happens is um, holiday menus become more elaborate. Um, but again, still not necessarily gingerbread. Um, I was looking um, at recipes uh, from that time period for Christmas, and they were really more um, for steamed pudding and fruit cakes, um, which you can see in this illustration that's very British. But those domed shaped things are steamed puddings. And fruitcakes we all know about, and uh, most of us dislike, but that was popular uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Gingerbread was more of an everyday recipe. Um, I found one in um, a book called Home Cookery, published by a church in Newtonville. And uh, the uh, recipe from a Mrs. J.F. Banchor uh, calls it the best soft gingerbread ever made. I actually made that one, and I wouldn't describe it that way, but you know, <laughs> she, uh, I guess, was, was part of the hype. Um, ginger was associated with the holidays, um, even if it wasn't necessarily in gingerbread. Here's another myth about it that I thought was interesting that people believed at that time. People thought that eating ginger during the cold weather could warm you up. <laughs> Probably also worked as well as those love cookies, but that was an idea. Um, also, ginger was considered classy because it was kind of rare. It had to be imported, um, and uh, it was a sign of wealth. Um, ginger came to um, this part of the world by ship at that time, um, and it was brought whole, uh, usually from um, India or Jamaica. And uh, it, was, um, it came in a flattened, dried piece called a race. I saw an illustration of it, and it's just 
you know, it looks like nothing. It, it looks like a, it is a root. I mean, it just looks like a piece of dried root. And you had to pound it with a hammer in order to make it. I mean, now we buy the powdered ginger in a jar, but that's what people were working with. So it wasn't as easy as just going to Roach Brothers and, and buying something off the shelf and sprinkling it in your cookies. Um, this woman, um, Sarah Josepha Hale, um, is, was the editor of uh, Godey's Ladies Book. She's also really instrumental in bringing Thanksgiving to, um, well, she was advocating for Thanksgiving as a national holiday. And President Lincoln is the one that signed that bill in the middle of the Civil War. In 1863, Christmas became a national holiday. But she loved holidays in general. Um, and so um, she, um, her Christmas recipes were like a Christmas pudding uh, made, you're going to like this ingredient list, uh, mashed potatoes mixed with ginger and other spices, flour, milk, eggs, suet, and raisins. <laughs> so I'm glad, you know, we've evolved since then. Um, and uh, then um, she had a Christmas cake. The ingredient list sounds better for this one. 18 eggs, brandy, almonds, mace, ginger, coriander, and cinnamon. Uh, so um, as Christmas uh, became more well-established as a holiday, we also got greeting cards. This is from the company Lewis Prang of Boston. Um, and uh, so the sweets became even more elaborate towards the end of the 19th century. Um, there was a pudding um, also published in um, Godey's Ladies Book calling for chestnuts, cream, eggs, and fruit plus macaroons and fancy cakes, all in one dessert. So um, you know, things are getting kind of over the top. Uh, but uh, we are finally getting to gingerbread cookies and gingerbread houses. Uh, so um, I could not find, this is a problem that historians have. Um, sometimes you know something happened, but you can't really find the exact date it happened. So you have to kind of put the pieces together. So um, what I kind of pieced together from looking at these magazines and other sources, cookbooks, is that um, when the immigrants brought their gingerbread traditions to America, then people just adopted them because they liked them. So I mentioned before the Hansel and Gretel house. Um, the Germans had these Lebkuchen houses, um, and uh, they were then becoming Christmas-themed gingerbread houses. So that's a kit that you can put together. Um, but I wanted to show the German origin of it. And um, the uh, cookies that they use um, come originally from the city of Nuremberg. Um, and uh, those cookies are called Lebkuchen. And actually, in my family, my family has German roots, even though we're Jewish. And um, we have Lebkuchen recipes as old family recipes. So I guess it was popular all throughout Germany, Christmas or not. Um, but um, anyway, that is, is that connection. And then the Dutch um, molded their gingerbread dough into the same shape of uh, St. Nicholas, also known as Santa Claus. Um, and then in general, a lot of immigrants to the US brought their love of Christmas baking and Christmas cookies to this country. Um, so by the 1930s, I thought this was a fun story. Um, you know, this shows you that Christmas was becoming more commercial in lots of ways. We have the big fat Santa Claus by this point um, advertising none other than Coke. Um, and uh, I'm taking a little diversion just because it's so interesting to look at some of the other Christmas foods before. And I promise you, we will get into the focus of um, when gingerbread kind of came to stay. Um, but this is uh, some bananas that were advertised as a special for Christmas in the 1930s. Um, and uh, they were praised as a standby for impromptu suppers and luncheons, easy to prepare and liked by everyone. Um, the 1930s also brought us refrigerators. Um, this is the kind of model that my grandmother had and called the ice box. Um, and it had um, the bottom uh, contain, well, it, it, it opened, and you could put a chunk of ice in there to keep the food cold inside of it. Um, it was also the time that packaged mixes um, and convenience foods like Bisquick 
came along. Um, and so it does tie to gingerbread because this is a company that created the first gingerbread mix. It's called the Dromedary Cake Mix Company. Um, and uh, it was in the 1930s um, that it helped make it easier for people to make gingerbread at home. And um, they launched a nationwide search for recipes and ended up partnering with the Kenmore Association, which ran a historic home in Virginia on the land where George Washington grew up. Remember, I showed you that photo. So that famous recipe from his mother, it's coming back in the form of this mix. Um, and um, they, um, this mix is um, based on the recipe from George Washington's mother. Um, and um, in exchange for being able to use that recipe to create the mix, they served gingerbread at um, the historic home um, where people visited, um, where uh, George Washington had grown up. And it also donated mixes um, to Daughters of the American Revolution chapters for 20, and they sold that as a fundraiser for 25 cents a box. And then during World War II, uh, the gingerbread was served um, to over 60,000 soldiers um, at the Kenmore House. Um, and there's still another tie-in, and there's still an annual gingerbread house competition at uh, Ferry Farm uh, where Washington grew up. So really a strong tie-in to George Washington in that recipe. Um, so um, that, in my mind, was sort of marking the time when gingerbread as a holiday treat was there to stay. Um, Christmas was becoming more commercial, as I mentioned before, with Santa Claus. This is actually from the 1950s, and it's an illustration. But look how robust the idea of Christmas is by then. And um, you know, you've got the shopping. This is obviously a well-to-do crowd, because look at the fur coat. And uh, you have the happy families and the supermarket advertising Christmas specials. And you also have the people buying trees at the supermarket and putting them on their car. Um, so at home, what were they serving? Well, um, now this is pretty much what you still see today. Um, I found in some of the women's magazines uh, that uh, the gingerbread house was featured on the cover, uh, and then the cookies were featured in an advertisement. So holiday gingerbread seems like it's really well established by the 1950s, even though I couldn't quite find out exactly when it all became linked up. And remarkably consistent. This is the 1970s, same type of thing. The gingerbread house that you see on the cover of Good Housekeeping um, and the cookies that you see advertised uh, by Pillsbury look still very, very similar um, to what you would see advertised and made today. Uh, so um, the um, thing that's interesting too is, you know, even in the age of the Food Network and the blogs, um, you still are seeing kind of traditional interpretations. Um, this is the contest, some examples from that contest at George Washington's childhood home. And this was just uh, a couple years ago uh, that these uh, were some of the entrants to that. Um, and then I mentioned the trees at the White House. Well, um, the Obama White House uh, had the pastry chef making a uh, pastry replica of the White House. Um, and then you can see uh, a marzipan replica of the Obama's dog <laughs> in front. Um, and there are some marzipan vegetables on the side. So you know, gingerbread houses, gingerbread cookies, those are definitely here to stay everywhere. Um, it's very consistent since medieval times that ginger is special and festive, no matter what form it takes, hard or soft, uh, baked into a house or baked into a cookie. It's definitely part of our tradition now. Um, so with that, I will stop and uh, be happy to take any questions. And there are also samples of gingerbread from Cape Brada and from Roach Brothers um, and coffee. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions? I see one back there. Yeah. Um, That's a great
great question. I don't know where the name ginger comes from. Um, it could be, although it's usually Virginia, and then the nickname for that is Ginny, but maybe ginger is another nickname. OK, so that's a possibility. Also, I know in England, they sometimes call people with red hair gingers. So I wonder if it came from that. Um, but that's an excellent question. That seems like something to try to find out more about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was dried, because the, um, the fresh ginger root, it really wouldn't last through shipping on a boat. Um, so um, it was dried, and so, as I said, it, it looked like sort of just a piece of bark or something, but that's what they had to pound. I don't think so, because I don't think he really wrote about gingerbread. Right. I think he was still more in the era of the steam puddings and the fruit cakes. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember that, but I'm not an expert. So if somebody knows more, um, please correct me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Well, Christmas. Right. Um, so it could be that his writing helped popularize Christmas as a holiday. But remember, Christmas was popular in England for a long time before it really became celebrated um, as widely in the United States. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think certainly that that story has transcended the Atlantic Ocean. So it, it could certainly be part of also remaking Christmas as more of a family-friendly holiday. Um, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. OK. Um, just curious, show of hands, who likes soft gingerbread versus hard? Who prefers soft? OK. And the hard one, like the ginger snap? Evenly split. Pr slight advantage to the soft, but right, right, yeah. I'm a soft fan, but <laughs> that's me, right, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, Amanda. Had used in what gingerbread? Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah. I was saying that they um, used molasses more often because um, that was an easier sweetener to find. Yeah, yeah, molasses is definitely darker than um, sugar, because sugar wasn't really that easy to get um, for a while in the colonies, um, you know, as the trade patterns were um, set up. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Well, that could maybe account for why we don't have any uh, portraits of her. <laughs> right, but um, that's really funny. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, so um, who knows? But that recipe certainly uh, had a long life after Mrs. Washington. That's right, that's right, yeah. Um, there is a whole cookbook um, of recipes from Mount Vernon, which was the home that George and Marsh Martha Washington lived in. Uh, put together by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. 
Um, and some of them are historic and some of them are not. So it would be interesting to go and find out what George and Martha Washington actually made if they used that recipe or if they didn't. That would be interesting to find out. Yeah. So anyway. Well, thank you so much for coming. Please feel free to ask me questions individually afterwards. And please have some cookies and coffee. And happy holidays. <laughs>